In the 1950s and 60s, tension between the oil producing countries and the oil companies of the West was to grow. Gather around now, everybody. Is everything ready over there? In Italy, struggling to industrialize after World War II, energy supplies were critical. New discoveries were celebrated in a carnival atmosphere. We can feel the earth shaking under our feet. It's a tremendous roar, a fantastic spectacle. The people are startled and moved. That flame shooting 90 feet into the sky is impressive even if you've seen it before. Oil was discovered in ever-growing quantities around the world. Western society was transformed by the ever more abundant fuel. But a battle was to begin for the control of this wealth. In October 1962, the Italian oil magnate Enrico Matte was plagued by anonymous death threats. He had made enemies in Italy and abroad and had alarmed governments and intelligence services on three continents. Matte had attempted to change the balance of power in world oil and secure for Italy a place in the sun. Matei was close to clinching a long sought after deal with Exxon and was due to meet President Kennedy in the United States. After visiting a refinery in Sicily, he boarded his corporate jet. It was to be his last journey. The plane crashed in dense fog just one minute from landing in Milan. Matte, his pilot, and a reporter for Time magazine were all instantly killed. Matte had often insisted in flying in bad weather. Some suspected sabotage. He had a lot of enemies, of course, and there had been uh, some attempt, very unclear, but some attempt of sabotaging a plane with a screwdriver. I spoke personally with the man who was a general of the Italian Air Force, and he said that there was no sign of any sabotage that he could understand. That didn't rule out some kind of sabotage he didn't know. There are very good people that believe that, in fact, the, the sabotage was there. Mattei had taken on Italy's establishment. He had made many powerful enemies. His vision of a new balance of oil wealth had challenged the global oil system. It was uh, for me and for many people in Italy a very bad day, very sad day. The only thing I can say that uh, he died at uh, just at the right moment for many people in the world. His opponents scorned him as the Napoleon of oil and the oil man without oil in what was the world's biggest business. He had a, a moral motivation. He never accepted the idea that you work for money, for example. He actually never got his salary. Very early in his career, in one of his high moments of dudgeon, he decided that all of the private oil companies, particularly the big ones, were in league to thwart his desire. <laughs> so in a moment of pique, he called us the Seven Sisters, and that name became quite paramount throughout the world. 
It didn't bother us that we were called the Seven Sisters. Matter of fact, it seemed to me that it was a tribute. He saw this group of large international majors linked together in joint ventures and keeping uh, people, people like Enrico Mattei, or trying to keep them out of the international business. And he was determined to break in and get his share of the business. <laughs> The major oil companies, the Seven Sisters, handled most of the oil that went to fuel the massive growth in the industrial world after the war. The world economy was making a dramatic shift from coal to oil. This was the oil age, and oil was cheap. The 60s and the 50s before them had been a period of, of very considerable growth year on year, 7% a year, every year. We, in fact, we couldn't believe it in our forecast, but it kept on happening. Every car of every make, any age in any shape, summertime and winter too, here's the oil that's right for you. So extra in America, cheap and abundant oil provided the basis for the hydrocarbon society, automobile culture and a new way of life. In a vast social revolution, tens of millions of people moved to the suburbs. Even Marilyn Monroe proclaimed the unique virtues of a brand of gasoline. This is the first car I ever owned. I call her Cynthia. She's going to have the best care a car ever had. Put Royal Triton in Cynthia's little tummy. Right, lady. Cynthia will just love that Royal Triton. The Hydrocarbon Society brought with it drive-ins, fast food, and a new prosperity. Millions took to the road on the new highways. A road sign points the way to one of America's great new superhighways. Now a motorist traveling from New York to Delaware can drive non-stop the 118 miles of the New Jersey Turnpike in two hours. The major companies fought to stimulate brand loyalty among motorists. Competition was cutthroat. But for all their rivalry, the different brands were virtually identical. And behind the competition, the companies worked together in joint ventures in many of the producing countries. You know, the oil companies work as a group. We all know that they are commercial entities different from each others. They compete with each others when it comes to marketing. But we all know that they decide among themselves how much oil should be produced. We all know that in a smoked room somewhere in Scotland, they get together and they decide on that, regardless of the antitrust law. These are facts very difficult to argue against it. The majors spanned the globe. They were pouring huge investments into every part of the business, from exploration to transportation, from refining to marketing. The countries where most of the new oil was coming from, the Middle East and Venezuela, were unhappy with their share of the take, the profit on oil. The oil companies never really had power in the sense the public think we did or, or even do have. We, 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 we really don't. In the 50s and 60s, it's true, we set prices. We set prices very low, of course, 
because prices had to decline at that time, was a surplus of oil. It's a bit like the emperor's clothes. If, if, you, if people think you've got power, in their perception, you have it. The oil companies acted as a state within the states in the producing countries. They felt that they have a free hand to reduce the price of oil the way they want. And during the 50s, they kept reducing the price of oil, which affected the revenues of the producing countries. This was not really acceptable. This was not economics. This was really in order to keep the price of oil so cheap for everywhere. It was boom time throughout the industrial world. As the production of oil went up, the price went down. Japan's astonishing growth was based on a strategic decision to switch its economy from coal to oil. The Japanese miracle transformed the country into a major industrial power. Most of Japan's oil, like that of the rest of the world, passed in one way or another through the hands of the majors. Government saw that oil was vital to the national interest. We and the government felt that we had real interests at stake because we, we didn't want oil in hostile hands. We wanted there to be a sufficient supply of oil in the world. But uh, we had no authority over the oil companies. One must always remember that. The American government uh, obviously considered was in its national interest to have the American oil companies dominate the world oil scene. In Italy, Enrico Mattei resented the Seven Sisters' control of world oil. When the majors formed a consortium to run the Iranian oil industry, he was furious that he had been excluded. He felt that his company, ENI, was being refused entry into an exclusive Anglo-American club. Certainly, it, it, it demonstrated what he was always saying. Big interests don't care for small interests. So if you want to sit down in a place, you have to fight hard for your, for your chair. And don't you believe that your allies will give you a chair unless you grab it? His vision was, of course, connected with energy. And that's the whole story of his life. So that in order to have a modern economy, you had to have energy, and uh, Italy didn't have any. Mattei had fought hard to build up ENI as the state energy company. He had grown up in a time of great national poverty. For generations, Italians had had to leave their country in search of jobs and a better life. This filled Mattei with indignation. The image of the Italian with a little bag made of cardboard, you know, getting out of the ship and having to sort of ask and to pray everybody to be accepted and to work like hell. And for very little money, that was his real, you know, bull. When he saw that, he got absolutely bizarre. He said, now that's finished, rather than as humble laborers, you know, or mandolin players. He had a particular fury about the mandolin players. I don't know why the mandolin is a beautiful instrument, but he thought that the image of the Italian who would go abroad playing the mandolin, you know, and basically begging for money, that would have to be canceled once for all. In the Second World War, Mattei joined the partisans in the mountains fighting against Mussolini's fascists. He was a natural leader. He quickly adopted the partisan technique of action, surprise, and total dedication to cause. As a reward for fighting the fascists after the war, he was put in charge of the ailing national oil company, Egypt. He was supposed to wind up the company and sell it off to private interests, but when he heard secret reports of massive deposits of oil in northern Italy, he ignored his orders and decided to drill. Instead of oil, 
he found natural gas. The big oil companies wanted to buy out this potential rival. There was an American delegation, and they visited him, and they practically offered him to renounce to this project, to exploit the, the Po Valley on behalf of Atip. They were offering him a blank check in order to give up. So despite the loud voices of those who thought Italy would benefit more if the foreign oil companies handled the whole affair, I decided to fight. Matte had to develop his new natural gas industry fast if he was to beat the competition from foreign coal and oil companies. It was a race against time. Of course, his money would come from gas. And the more gas he sold, the more money he had, the more he could invest. You see, it was a virtuous cycle. And he jumped on it with an extraordinary energy. He would have to cut corners and adopt the partisan technique. Action first, get permission later. When this man came, we thought that he was mad because he wanted to do something that we considered impossible. But after that, I know him. I jumped from the window if he ordered me to do so. One day, Mattei decided to do everything without permissions. So during the night, some thousand of people did the work of laying the pipeline. Work that normally requested two or three weeks has been made during one night in a few hours. If an irate mayor complained that his town had been dug up in the middle of the night, Mate would apologize and offer to abandon work immediately, only to be begged to continue as quickly as possible. His next move was to smarten up the image of the company. He modernized his gasoline stations and provided restaurants and service. He even had a cartoon film made to encourage pump attendants to clean up their act. Mate's campaign began to win customers away from the majors. We want to do something completely different with lights, chromium, in modernity, you know, service. And, and uh, he had a special phobia about canvas chairs. Whenever he went to to check, because you went to check personally, gasoline station, if you saw a canvas chair, he would start kicking it around the side, shouting like hell. And then he would go and see the bathroom. And uh, if, the, if the bathroom was dirty, then he would explode completely, sort of raise the ground, sort of bomb the site and change it completely. He thought, and the Italians wanted modernity. And for him, modernity was the motorways and the great shining signs of the dog, you know, and uh, the service, that was modernity for him. Mate was doing well fighting the majors through his Egypt service stations, but he still desperately wanted to join the club and get into the crude oil business. Using his network of influence and patronage, Mate would mobilize any contacts and connections and his own considerable political skills to advance ENI's interests. He was called the most important and powerful man in Italy. His next step obviously meant that he must find and become an intimate part of the crude gathering clan, if I might call it that, throughout the world. Uh, this became an obsession with him. Every time I would see him, even in a casual way, he'd say, when are you going to let me have some of the crude business as an owner? We and all the other oil companies that I know of saw no reason why this fine patriot in Italy should immediately grab a hunk or a piece of what they had earned over 50 years of search and development and hardship. The major oil companies combined all aspects of the business, integrating exploration, production, transportation, refining, and marketing in one system. Throughout the whole history of the oil business, 
has been the fact that they had to build service stations. They had to build refineries. They had to build tankers. The companies would never think of spending all of this money unless at the back end of all of this was the production of crude oil, where the money really is made. Mate wanted to get to that profitable end of the business. He devised a way to do it. ENI was a state-owned enterprise, and Mate was, in fact, a government civil servant. He believed this would give him an advantage when going to foreign governments and offering them a better deal. The point was that he was advocating a completely different policy of connection between a, an underdeveloped oil producer and the big developed oil consumers of the West. And uh, it's sort of a completely different rearrangement of things, which was perhaps too high of his times. Strongly anti-colonial in stance, Mate would appeal to the nationalism of the producers. As the head of a state-owned company, he would promote government-to-government -government deals that would cut out the private companies. With his new strategy in mind, Mate was looking for someone to do business with. He did not have far to look. Just across the Mediterranean in Egypt, Mate found a partner, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Well, Nasser was his great friend. Nasser was the man that Mate thought would bring the third world into the modern age, you see? That was that kind of man. And they were very deep personal friends. And uh, uh, Mate wouldn't accept anybody having the slightest doubt or Nasser, either way, he wasn't a man of nuances. <laughs> he was either black or white, and for him, Nasser was white. Nationalism in Egypt was becoming a powerful force. Colonel Nasser had seized power in a bloodless military coup and on a tide of anti-colonial feeling. He was electrifying the Arab world with his own brand of pan-Arab nationalism. In the coffee houses of Cairo, his message was eagerly received. In what he described as his partnership deal, Mate promised Nasser an unprecedented 75% of the potential profits from future exploration. Although Egypt's production was so small that the deal had little direct impact, the principle shattered the 50-50 profit split that had become standard over the previous few years. The deal with Egypt was based on the 75-25 splitting, sharing of this, uh, the profit. And it was the first that was applied in all the world. The major oil companies would have been horrified, but Mate and Nasser kept the New Deal secret for political reasons. By now, Nasser was well aware of oil's strategic importance. The Suez Canal was the Western world's oil lifeline to the Persian Gulf. When the Americans and the British canceled a large loan to Egypt, a furious Nasser decided to act. <laughs> Nasser's nationalization of the canal came as a complete surprise. And when the Egyptians took over the offices of the Anglo-French Suez Canal Company, there was no resistance. His action incensed the governments of Britain and France, and together with Israel, they determined to use force. Crack French units are embarked at Marseille, bound for a joint staging area with Great Britain on Cyprus. And its bombers attack five key cities, including Cairo. The military campaign was halted, partly because of opposition from United States President Eisenhower, who was furious because he had not been consulted. 
Eisenhower was just running for re-election, and the last thing he wanted was a new war that would stir nationalist passions against the West. He refused to help the British and the French, and told them instead to boil in their own oil. Nasser emerged triumphant, giving a great boost to nationalism in the Arab world. Britain and France were forced to withdraw. Suez was a warning to the oil-consuming West. Enrico Mate was quick to exploit that rising tide of nationalism and anti-colonial feeling. He offered the Shah of Iran the 75-25 deal. The majors were outraged by Mate's intrusion and his new terms. He then thought of what, in my opinion, was a far more superior and dangerous method of pressure to put on us to achieve his desire. The Soviets were expanding oil production and seeking new markets. Matei bought the Russian oil for less than a dollar a barrel and helped them build a pipeline towards the West. The majors were again outraged. In their view, Mate was bringing more oil into an already glutted market and forcing the prices down. Mate hoped that when the Western government saw his deal with the communists, they would force the sisters to let his company, E&I, into their club. Strategic Air Command B-52 bombers, already on a massive worldwide airborne alert, are now flying 24-hour missions. The world was at the height of the Cold War. The oil business is radically a political business, dominated by big powers. There is very few market forces and the relations among these big powers are not uh, uh, relations uh, of invisible hands, but perhaps uh, by invisible minds. And uh, this is uh, more like, uh, more, more close uh, or to uh, the war game than to the market game. On October 27th, 1962, Matei's plane crashed. His legacy was ENI, which would become the eighth largest international oil company in the world. Matei had not been the only one to challenge the rules of the oil game. Like Matei, the Venezuelan Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso also wanted to change the system. He had fled from a military coup at home and was living as an exile in Washington. It was here that the idea of OPEC was born. He wanted the producing countries to form a united front against the oil companies and by limiting supply, force up the price. Perez Alfonso was a conservationist at heart. He applied this conservationist philosophy to oil. He was a very austere man. He was concerned about the natural resources of Venezuela. He was concerned about the energy resources. Perez Alfonso believed the oil companies were exploiting Venezuelan oil too rapidly and that it would soon run out. His idea was to reduce production. His view of the world and of the need for cooperation drove him towards seeking a compact between Venezuela and the emerging major producers of the Middle East. When he arrived in Washington, he reacted against the way of life as it was then. Great day in the morning, sunshine in my prayer. In the United States, consumption was increasing rapidly. More and bigger cars were using more and more gasoline. Great day in the showroom, blue skies all the way.
But the producing countries were not happy about their share of the take. What we were getting was a peanuts, really. And unfortunately, the oil companies felt that they can do what they want. No one can ask them. So they kept overproducing, reducing the price of oil, giving the governments of producing countries as little as they want. And that was the action of the oil companies. But when they overdid it, there was a reaction. And this is what brought Prez Alfonso to get in touch with the responsible people in the producing areas. Abdullah Tariki was Saudi Arabia's oil minister and, like Perez Alfonso, wanted to reduce the power of the Western oil industry. Tariki and Perez Alfonso had a friend in common. She was Wanda Jablonski, a petroleum journalist who by her tenacity had created a unique place for herself in the industry. She had toured the Middle East and knew everybody who was anybody in the oil business. When she visited Tariki, the two hit it off, and she cabled back to her magazine in New York that his radical ideas made him the man to watch. At the Arab Oil Congress in Cairo in 1959, Tariki was to meet the man who shared his views. It was Wanda Jablonski who brought Perez Alfonso and Abdullah Tariki together over a bottle of cola in the Nile Hilton. Feelings were running high among the delegates. The majors had just arbitrarily cut the price of oil. The two men agreed that the producing countries should unite against the oil companies. But for this common front to be effective, Perez Alfonso would need to win the cooperation of every major oil exporter in the Middle East. The observer from Iran needed persuading. So he told me, look here, I'm going to get these people together and so forth. So that was his idea. We must be honest about it. That was nobody's ideas but his. He gave an explanation. Don't fear about anything. They secretly rendezvoused at a yacht club in a suburb of Cairo. There they worked out a draft agreement for future cooperation. Not everybody was ready to sign. When the drop was given to me, I was sitting beside Perez Alfonso. I told him, look here, why should I sign this? I'm an observer in this place. Um, I have no status in this place. Why should I sign? Although little more than a gentleman's agreement, the document could lay the basis for joint action if everybody would agree to sign it. Then he told me, if you in the Middle East, you don't sign this, none of these Arabs would ever sign it. So it depends on you. If you want to sign it, sign it. If you're not, let's break up. Well, I was a bit uh, forced somehow, and uh, it went against uh, the system of my government. Nevertheless, I took the paper and I signed it. He was the second one to sign it. We gave it to the Arabs and all of them, they signed it. But there was no guarantee that this gentleman's agreement would lead anywhere. Then, a year later, the oil glut led the majors once again to cut the price, this time by 14 cents to less than $2 a barrel. They kept reducing the posted price, reducing the revenues of the producing countries until it was August 1960, the last drop, the last decrease in the price of oil. This brought all the producers together to think seriously and to establish OPEC. OPEC was formed in Baghdad in 1960. The oil companies refused to acknowledge its existence. For the architects, Abdullah Tariki and Perez Alfonso, the battle was just beginning. The first general secretary was an Iranian, Fuad Rouhani. The, the oil companies used every possible means of undermining and weakening OPEC. They tried to make trouble for individuals such as myself that they thought uh, stood in the way of their interests. 
And in particular, they went through direct and indirect means of uh, threatening the governments. Inside OPEC at that time, we had Venezuela as the radical member. We had Iran as the one opposing Venezuela. And it was very difficult to reconcile the two and to have a compromise. The oil companies were behind the scene. When OPEC prepared to act unilaterally for the first time in 1963, the Shah of Iran was torn. Should he support OPEC or go along with the oil companies? It was perfectly obvious that something had been, uh, had been said to him. And uh, he had come to the conclusion that he could not, that Iran could not proceed with the unilateral measures. And this was six days after the Tehran riots in which Ayatollah Khomeini figured prominently. When the Six-Day War broke out in 1967 between Israel and its neighbors, the Arab oil exporters attempted to embargo oil supplies to countries that supported Israel. But that effort failed because there was just too much oil around. In the 1960s, the biggest new source of oil was Libya. Here, as elsewhere, the position of the majors was under attack from a new direction, as hundreds of independent companies rushed to enter the international oil business. It was an open invitation for all those who would like to make a quick fortune. almost like the gold rush or the oil boom in the United States. There are all sorts of characters, wheeler, dealers, uh, gamblers, uh, outlaws, uh, adventurers. It was a, a bonanza, a North African bonanza. Libya was a very poor country. Its export earnings came from scrap metal left over from desert battles in World War II and from a type of grass used to make paper money. But now the Libyan regime saw the chance to make some real money from oil. The Libyans encouraged independent companies to join the oil rush. These independents were to undermine the dominant position of the majors. Dr. Armand Hammer was one such independent. An unlikely oil man, he had wheeled and dealed his way around the world, trading in Russian art, medical drugs, bourbon whiskey, and bull semen. At the age of 57, he married for the third time, and after the honeymoon, retired to California. He acquired some oil wells as a tax shelter, and then bought a dormant oil company called Occidental. He couldn't bear sitting around in his California house when there was money to be made. And as luck would have it, Occidental struck a natural gas field and became an overnight success. He constantly worked. I mean, he worked 18 hours a day, and everything that he did, every activity, whether it was art or socializing or anything else that he ever did, he managed to turn into an Occidental connection. He called the vice presidents and said, of all the places in the world, where would you like to be? Where would you like to go? Uh, the answer was Libya. Occidental had become a large company through acquisitions, but Hammer needed a big oil discovery if he was really going to hit the big time. He made many enemies along the way, including one of Occidental's former executives. Management style was desperate. He was desperate about growing rapidly. He was desperate about earnings. He was desperate about his image. He was desperate about just about anything. That Dr. Hammer was not immoral. He was amoral. He had no morals at all. He was a man that felt that he could buy his way out of any situation. Getting concessions in Libya justified any means whatever, and that's how he went about things. 
Libya was ruled by the feudal King Idris. A devout Muslim but a weak monarch, he was surrounded by corruption. For Hammer, King Idris and Libya were the keys to turning himself into a major player. By 1965, there had been so much uh, oil discovered in Libya and production was coming online so rapidly that a lot of companies, including those that were established and new companies coming in, were desperately anxious to get a hold of what was viewed as the uh, Libyan bonanza. And the, so there was a really frantic quest for the right influence uh, peddler. Hammer tried everything to find the man with the right amount of influence. At last, he managed to get an introduction to the king's trusted advisor, Omar Shali. The king had adopted Omar after his father, the head of the king's household, had been assassinated. Although Hammer would have to pay him a commission on every barrel of oil, Omar had exactly the right amount of influence. My relationship with the king became like a son and a father. I was almost like his shadow. I accompanied him wherever he went. The king gave me his, his trust. I could feel his trust. When I talked to him, he listened carefully. One day I got a telephone call from a business acquaintance, and he asked me if I could meet a certain Arman Hammer, president of Occidental. First time I hear about Occidental. He was a very good listener. He was adaptable. Elusive, very elusive when he wants, and very boring. <laughs> he talked about nothing, or mostly about money, money, money. Omar knew the way to the king's heart. He told Hammer that he should offer to develop an oasis at Kufra into a California in the desert. Such a scheme would delight the king and help persuade him to grant Hammer an oil concession. Hammer was uh, absolutely excited. Whenever I mentioned to him the idea of Kufra, I could see his eyes flashing with happiness. I think from that point, he knew he was on the correct track. Archie, what makes you think there's water out there? If you could step over here, Doctor, I would uh, show you the area I'm talking about. And uh, during our conversation and how optimistic he was, he said, Omar, I'm going to make you the richest man in Europe. One of the concessions that Occidental wanted it got, but the other at the last minute it could not get, and it had to take an adjoining one instead. And the, uh, the proposition was very simple, take it or leave it. The company took it, and that concession turned out to be the most valuable one uh, that Occidental had, and probably one of the most valuable concessions ever given in Libya. The test well on it, which my recollection is was the second or third well drilled, uh, came in at about just shy of 75,000 barrels a day. Uh, that's an enormous amount of oil. People want to know why you go overseas to look for oil, and that's the answer. Hammer's use of new technology enabled him to find oil on a concession previously explored and abandoned by Mobile. One of the reasons that the other companies disliked Armin Hammer immensely was that he used to crow about that all the time and say, ha, 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 you know, Bobo drilled and couldn't find, and we did and did find. At the inauguration of his new pipeline, built in record time, Hammer paid tribute to the king and his kingdom. To make this once oppressed land a dynamic nation of freedom, strength, hope, and promise. Then came the bombshell. <laughs> Momar al Qaddafi, a young army officer, staged a successful military coup. This would prove to be bad news for the oil companies. <laughs> Qaddafi held a strong hand because the world oil glut was coming to an end.
Gaddafi knew absolutely nothing about international oil and cared less. He simply saw that, that there had been uh, terms that had been accepted by a monarch that he had now thrown out, and so he had to throw out the terms under which the companies had come into Libya. Gaddafi wanted control over his oil and more revenue. The major oil companies resisted. The Libyans could see that the independents, in particular Hammer, were the weak link. Libya was Hammer's only source of supply. The Libyans slashed his production. Hammer was desperate. He begged the majors to sell him crude at cost if he was nationalized. The majors turned him down. Hammer was cornered. Gaddafi and his deputy, Major Jaloud, were intensifying the pressure on Occidental. I had called to Dr. Hammer and told him that now it's getting dangerous, it's looking, uh, we could get nationalized. With survival in the oil industry at stake, Hammer immediately set off for Libya and at once began frantic negotiations with the regime. On the fourth day was when it was supposed to be an agreement and you sort of agreed all the different pieces of it. So then it was supposed to be where the dock can sign. But what happened was that Major Jaloud explained that we're going to sign but it will be a secret piece of paper. And actually, we can even see what, what, what we saw. It was, in, uh, it was in Arabic, and it was very, very short. You couldn't even read what, what, what it said. Um, and that's when the doc became very, very upset. Uh, he just didn't think it think doesn't look right. But Hammer knew when he was beaten. The doc pulled me aside and said, George, in some way, well, you can close that agreement. And then he didn't, so he just quietly walked right to his staff, and they got on the plane, and they went away. Hammer's surrender cost him an immediate 30 cents a barrel, and the Libyans would get 55% of the profits. This was the first time that a producing country had dictated the terms to an oil company. It was very significant, because Armand Hammer, with his signature, forced the other oil companies operating in Libya to follow suit. And the shortage created in the market by the absence of about 30% of the oil, uh, Libyan oil production, kept the price from going down and forced it to go up. It changed the whole picture. Hammer's surrender in Libya marked the point at which power clearly began to pass to the producing countries. Enrico Mate had helped start that process. Abdullah Tariki and Perez Alfonso had fought for it. Now the rise of nationalism, the independence, and the shift in supply and demand all meant a new era in world oil. The heyday of the majors was over. And it was funny, we were signing those agreements, and it was just myself and two other uh, employees who had done with me. And I thought to one of them, I said, you know, it's, it's it's kind of a shame, but it's kind of scary. Remember what's happened with signing this thing. Every person in the Western world, every car, every plane, every truck, wherever you move, it would be more expensive. And funnily enough, uh, and I thought about it a little later on, uh, a few more years, it got a lot more expensive next on the prize the tinderbox shrewd dealmakers 
OPEC learned how to play the oil game with the West to their advantage. But the oil companies still had a few cards up their sleeve. The high-stakes poker game was careening out of control, threatening to ignite the smoldering Middle East tinderbox. Based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning book by Daniel Yergin, The Prize.